frustrated by fragmented analytics data and clunky pipelines, then Rutherstack is about to change your data game. In this video, I'm gonna dive into its futures and everything you need to know to understand how the CDP or customer data platform and the entire infrastructure of a tool like Rutherstack can really transform how your team works and then activates data. Whether you're a marketer, product manager, data analyst, or just an executive looking to get more value out of your data, Rutherstack is a great place to start. Let's jump right in. Let's start by understanding the core value proposition of a tool like Rutherstack. This is the customer data platform space. You have other players like Segment.com and Particle. Rutherstack is a newer addition that they've been doing quite well. If we actually look into the homepage right here, you see they're sort of talking about data wrangling, right? The core promise of a product like Rutherstack is the ability to connect data from different sources, perhaps a website, mobile apps, backends, cloud apps like HubSpot, Salesforce, Facebook ads, Google ads, and then send that to even more destinations, typically in the hundreds. And you do this all through a single API, a single integration. So if you implement, let's say, uh, e-commerce events, you know, a product added, a view card, checkout, and that kind of stuff, you do that once, and you can then send that to hundreds of destinations, and Rutherstack will do the conversion for you into all the sort of nitty-gritty specifications that every tool out there has. If you look at the products here in the top menu, we can see some of the things we're talking about. We're talking about event stream, right? We have to collect events uh, across the entire customer journey, all the way from front end to back end apps, maybe transform the data. You might be enriching things. You, you, know, you might be adding things to profiles, for example, to create a single file unified profile, or maybe just simply doing some basic transformations to your data to clean it up, removing PII, there's some data governance, of course, which is related to transformation, just ensuring that your data stays at a high level of quality. You're rejecting any errors and preventing any messy data from flowing down downstream to any of your tools. Then we have a few other things that reverse ETL, which we're going to look at in a second. But this is the core proposition. And if I look at show you the product, it kind of looks like this at its most basic level, right? You're going to have sources. You may have one, five, 10, 15 sources. And you can have destinations again one, 10, 15, 20 different sources. Many teams to stay, these days typically have easily, you know, 20, 30 different sources. Typically very common things, Facebook ads, Google ads, TikTok ads, a mix panel, Amplitude, uh, maybe some full story, a CRM like HubSpot and so forth. And here I have just a basic backend server, HTTP server, and then just Google ads, very basic actual setup. But this is the, the, the core thing that we're building here. So instead of integrating manually to all these integrations, you can do it once, and save yourself a lot of time. Plus you get all these tools to be able to protect the quality of your data. And of course, once you have your data here, then it's much easier to activate it, which typically just means you're gonna create some kind of tangible output. For example, you may create an audience of uh, purchases who uh, have not purchased anything in say the last 30 days. And then once you have this audience of existing customers who have not been recently active, you might send that to your email marketing platform to send a bunch of emails. Maybe they go to your CRM where they're gonna be handled by specific sales reps if they're a specific value. Maybe to Facebook ads to run a retargeting campaign and so forth, right? So you start to activate the data in ways that's actually gonna be tangible and actually drive some value for the business. Without tools like Rutherstack, the activation portion can be actually quite tricky because you spend all your time simply wrangling data, cleaning it, trying to maintain some kind of pipeline, ensure it gets updated, living with a bunch of CSVs and Excels. So you, you do this first, and then the activation is typically pretty straightforward by that point. So let's look at how hard is it to ingest data. That is the very first step you have to do when it comes to setting up Rutherstack. Let's start with the SDKs. So from an SDK perspective, you're gonna see very standard stuff. You have the JavaScript, this core SDK. Then you have mobile apps, you know, iOS, Android, and you know, equivalents like React Native. Server SDKs, depending on what you're using, Ruby, Java, uh, Java, and so forth. If you open the JavaScript one, just to see a few things. Again, if you've seen any kind of these tools out there before, uh, they all typically work on an event model and user model. That is, you have events. Uh, they have event names, event properties. You know, a user purchases something, that's an event, and then the bunch of properties tell you what the user purchased, like the uh, product name, the price, and so forth. And then you may have user properties, like first name, last name, email, uh, geographic data, and so forth. So we see a lot of the different things. I find the Rutherstack SDKs are typically well-documented, uh, despite being a, a younger tool compared to like a segment.com or something like that. So you do have uh, a lot of things that can show you how to sort of get going with the, with the SDK, 
specific things related to the SDK, uh, maybe how to handle consent, uh, how to deal with app blockers, in this case, since we're talking about JavaScript, uh, and a few other things. So generally, again, pretty straightforward. Here are the, the common methods, right? Like the track calls, group calls for organizations, uh, maybe page for page views, identify for sending those user properties, user, user records. And these are the SDKs. They all kind of function in a very similar way, depending on what language you're working on. So you may do some work implementing events manually like this, wherever the data lives, and your developer goes through it, they write the code, the little snippets of code, and they fire the events into Roger Stack. This is one way you can get data into the platform. The second way is to use cloud apps and just simply import data. So we have a bunch of other uh, cloud apps that are supported as sources, that is, they, they can send data to Roger Stack. We have AppSlider, uh, Brace, of course, Postdoc, and a few other ones. If you look at Brace, actually, it's a good example. Brace, of course, is an email marketing platform, and you can connect it to your, to your router stack. Brace will then send data into router stack, and it'll actually send all these different events here. Basically, events around sort of email lifecycle, like you know, email sent, email open. Uh, this is a concept that Brace has around canvases, this sort of journey-like uh, functionality, and a bunch of it. So you know, there's about, what, 20, 30 events that Brace can send, and of course, there's a bunch of properties that Brace is sending alongside those events. So this is another way you can get data into router stack. You can see a lot of things here. You have Shopify, for example, right? Where Shopify can send data here. And if we scroll down, we're gonna see some of the events, right? Like checkout delete, checkout update, here's the order create. So we have a bunch of stuff related to your e-commerce store that Shopify can send automatically. This is actually very helpful because then, of course, you don't have to do this manually, one thing. But the second thing is typically, these tools that can send data automatically tend to be highly reliable. Uh, there's very little downtime, very little issue that you typically run into uh, if you're dealing with a tool like a Shopify or like a Brace. So Cloud Apps is the second way to get data into Roger Stack. And again, it's not an either or, you might just be using both. You might manually implement some events, perhaps from your backend or something where you, know, you don't have some kind of Cloud App. And of course, perhaps from any apps you might be implemented directly into it. As you can see as well, uh, you could just actually do this manually, you know, if your cloud app is not here, but it can output some kind of webhook. Perhaps you can just implement that and get Router Stack to catch that webhook and then take the data in. So there is some flexibility. And the third way, which I think is helpful to mention, is actually a reverse ETL process. This is much more common today. There are standalone players in the space, like a census or high touch, but Router Stack does offer a reverse ETL functionality. This means that if you have your data in data warehouse, or you can get your data into a data warehouse, like a BigQuery, like a Redshift, like a Databricks, you can then run a reverse ETL, which basically just means writing some kind of SQL query. It creates a table or a data model, and then RouterStack can then ingest that data. There's a few details here, of course, on how RouterStack will be able to maintain uh, the table up to date, so how it knows there has, there, have, there has been updates or diffs on the table. But this is a way where you can take data in probably the most flexible format out there, a data warehouse, and then bring it in while sort of molding it into that event, event property, and user property model that Router Stack expects. So reverse ETL is very handy. Uh, it's relatively new, perhaps in the last few years, it's become more popular. It's a very, very flexible way of dealing with data. And if you don't want to kind of play around with webhooks, that kind of stuff, just take your data out of the data warehouse and just simply write, you know, sort of vanilla SQL to reverse ETL the data back into Roger Stack and then make it available to everything else. Again, read the caveats because you, you do have to make sure you have certain things like a user ID, uh, perhaps a, a way for Roger Stack to identify when the table changes or some kind of timestamp. So there's a few things you have to note that make this a little bit more of a technical solution. But if you have that capacity capability, this becomes one of the most flexible ways of working with data. Once you have your data in Rather Stack, of course, we want to take it out. That's the whole premise that we're doing here. So for this, we have to look at destinations. So let's look again to documentation here, just so you can see. Typically, destinations is all a numbers game. You know, we're talking about hundreds of destinations, and it's all about adding more and more destinations over time. Uh, you can see Rather Stack, of course, has a very big list, naturally categorized. It's quite nice. Uh, and you're gonna find here pretty standard stuff, right? Google Analytics, the mix panel, all the different pixels out there from the major ad platforms. There's the AB testing tools. Under, let's say, email, we are gonna find uh, a lot of tools like Brace. It's gonna be somewhere in here, right? Under the marketing category with Active Campaign, MailChimp, uh, productivity apps. Of course, data warehouses themselves are a type of, of that type of destination. And again, once you have your data uh, structure for Roger Stack, 
add-on at destination is typically pretty straightforward. You kind of go in, you enable it, it's kind of point and click. In fact, I can actually show you in a second. You know, once we're here and we add a destination, we kind of go through a list. Let's say we're going to do amplitude. We're going to choose our source. And then we have a few things. You know, maybe we want to name it. We need an API key. Maybe we have a, a, a server requirement if we're in the US or we want the European uh, server. And that's typically it, right? From that moment on, there, there's a lot of things that Rarsac will not do automatically for you. It might give you a few other options around how to handle sessions and other amplitude-specific things. But generally, the connection of the destination might just take a few minutes because you already have the data structure in the way Rarsac expects it. Some destinations have specific requirements. They are looking for specific uh, properties or events. So you want to check those out and see what those look like. But again, it's generally not a complex process once you have your data in. Let's also talk about warehouse destinations. Again, the same concept. You can actually send data to your warehouses. In this case, you have a few more options, but again, pretty standard, BigQuery, Redshift, Databricks. Uh, and then they, they receive your data in some kind of data model that makes sense for that specific warehouse. It's also helpful to talk about connection modes when it comes to destinations. You typically have three modes. You have cloud, device, and hybrid. Uh, typically, when something's on the cloud, it means it doesn't load directly on your app itself. This is perhaps more noticeable if you're loading things on the website or on the web app. So if, it, if it's on the cloud, it's not loading on the page itself. If it's on device, of course, it is loaded on the device itself. And then hybrid tends to be a mixture of both. If we scroll down here a little bit, right, we see, for example, cloud mode simply means that the data will be received by Rather Stack. It, in the cloud, gets transformed and it gets sent over to the tool itself. Benefits, of course, not, not loading things on device it might speed up your app. It might mean fewer, fewer things actually loading uh, on the device itself. And typically for most tools, you know, loading on the cloud is actually not a big deal. Uh, it, they all still work very well. If you need device mode though, then Rarsdag will actually load that app on the app itself. Uh, sometimes the way the SDKs interact changes a little bit once the device mode is enabled. So again, you want to sort of check that, see how that works. A good example of this actually typically is mobile apps where a tool like AppFlyer needs to load directly on the device to be able to do the attribution properly. You, cannot just, you can't just do the attribution on the cloud. So depending on what tool it is, you might need device mode, but again, you have to double check the settings. And unless we have hybrid mode where Rutherstack will decide to send some data through the client itself in a sort of device mode and other data through the cloud, you can see actually it's only a handful of destinations that support hybrid mode, so you're likely not going to run into it too much. And honestly, I think just cloud advice is typically good enough. Either you choose one or the other. And typically these days, you're choosing a lot of cloud just to kind of keep things a little speedy and a little bit more organized. Next, let's look at a little bit of transformations, right? So you have your data in from Rutherstack for some kind of source. You're deciding where to send it through a, some kind of destination, but you may need to transform it a little bit before it gets there. So let's, let's look at, at what it looks like to create a transformation. Here we can see some of the sort of templates that, that, we are, that we're using. Common things, right? For example, we may need to uh, anonymize the IP. Some tools reject PII altogether. Google Analytics is a good example where you really do not want to send any kind of uh, PII, typically like first name, last name, email. Uh, I do believe Google Analytics actually does support IP address and then they, they discard it. But some tools, again, uh, and depending on your policies, you may not want to send PII in any shape or form. So this is one of the most common use cases for transforming data. This means that you, you can sort of ingest all the data as needed. Uh, you're not removing the PII at the source level, but you are removing it at, at the destination level before it gets sent somewhere else. Let's look at a few other things. Geolocation enrichment is actually kind of cool. You know, typically most tools actually will take the PII and convert it to uh, a city, region, and country. So having a function for doing that is helpful. Again, replacing PII, uh, similar to IP anonymization or hashing PII. For example, Facebook ads typically require some PII to be hashed, like a first name or last name or email. Uh, they don't want just the, the plain text email, so it needs to be hashed. Again, if you're connecting Facebook ads, typically Rutherstack has actually built that in into the logic of that destination. But you want to double check things, you want to be careful, or you may have something that doesn't quite do that automatically. You have here a way to to uh, hash that PII. Renaming, of course, extracting your parameters. You know, you might use this for, for example, uh, marketing attribution, and you're extracting UTM source, UTM medium, UTM campaign, and so forth from a URL. Let's say we want to take hash and PII. We get effectively a, a function here, just a basic JavaScript function. And in here, we are taking 
uh, maybe import in the library in this case, which we're going to use for hashing. Uh, other, other functions may not have this, of course. Then we're going to take the event. So every event that flows to destination, right? We're going to get the event and the metadata itself. Uh, we're going to look for the email, which is going to be somewhere in the event metadata. In this case, it's going to be somewhere in the context traits.email, probably. Uh, but you want to change this to whatever you need it. And then we take it. If email exists, then we're just going to hash it as email. And then we're going to return the entire event back into destination now with the hash PII. Uh, if you've seen the sort of the segment of com functions, this is very similar. Uh, so it's very handy, of course. You, you have sort of plain vanilla JavaScript here. You can do a lot. Uh, you can change the function very uh, in many different ways. I find this to be very, very powerful just simply because helpful to make this little tweaks instead of asking developers to do it over and over again, especially once you have the source data and you can do everything. Of course, you can import a, uh, APIs here or you can call APIs. You can do a bunch of stuff. Another thing about transforming data will be the, the data catalog or the, the data governance. Uh, again, typically here you add in some kind of tracking plan uh, where you're saying, hey, these are the events I'm expecting. Here are the 10 events with you know the bunch of properties and the uh, property names and the type of values that we're expecting, integers, numbers, strings, booleans, whatever. We put it in. You can then run it against sources. And if there's anything that doesn't fit into tracking plan, you can then decide to either discard it altogether or perhaps to allow it but raise some kind of notification. So you get some choices. Again, this prevents the quality of data that flows into your downstream destinations to always be of the highest quality. You can be very, very strict here, and it prevents sort of garbage data from piling up, which inevitably really happens, right? You have so much, so much data flowing through. Uh, it's hard to keep this within control unless you have something like this basically at the source level, just simply looking at every single event, every single property, every single property value to make sure it fits to what you expect. So again, just another handy way of, of protecting all the work you have done to ingest data, maybe transform it, and ensure that whatever flows into a downstream destination is correct. Finally, let's look at pricing over a couple minutes. Uh, so they have 1 million events for free. Uh, you get you know, a lot of the core functionality, the sources, the destination, reverse ETL. And then depending on how many million of events you have per month, then you have a bit of quotes here of what this might look like on a monthly basis, usually built annually. But of course, you can look at the bill monthly up here and see how that changes. There's probably you know, like a 20% discount as usual for an annual billing. And then here, you, besides the event volumes, you get the data governance, email support, the SLA. But I will say that the core Redis Stack product is available here. You are limited in some ways. Like I think some of the reverse ETL functions are limited to something like 10 functions or something. But uh, you do have access to quite a bit. So you can grow up with events. Uh, some tools charge based on, on monthly track users, uh, so unique users that, that flow through your data. There's pros and cons to both events and monthly track users. It depends. You kind of have to run the numbers on your own data and see what this will cost you. I will say, though, generally speaking, when you run the math and you take into account engineering time, the time to fix errors, the time to wait for data to be activated, and a bunch of other things, opportunity costs, CDPs by far typically are worth it. Even if you're paying something like 150, 250,000, half a million dollars a year in a CDP. Typically, it's worth it, but you have to go all the way through and implement it correctly, ingest as much data as possible, flow it to as many destinations as possible, and really consolidate data as much as possible within your CDP. Uh, so if you're going this way, that's my recommendation. Really commit to it. This is a you know, six, 12 month project to get everything going and data activated. But once you do, a lot of things become really easy from a data perspective. That's all I have for today. My name is Ruben Garte. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video. One last thing, if you're ready to finally get more insights out of your data, I highly recommend you check out this short video. It's actually one of the most popular videos here on my channel. It's only a few minutes long, and it shows you how to turn your data into actionable insights that you can then take and use it to drive revenue and growth, reduce costs, and much more. So I highly check out you, you check out that video. And until next time, we'll talk soon.